everyone. We are ready to get started. I wanted to thank all of you for joining today. My name is Jennifer Morris and I'm with Madcap Software. Joining me today is one of my favorite educators, Neil Perlin, owner of HyperWord Services, certified Madcap Flare trainer and consultant as well. And today, Neil is gonna talk about the very important topic of link types in Flare. So Flare offers a wide variety of link types to help direct readers uh, to get more information, or to get related information. Links such as hyperlinks, cross-references, drop-down links, toggler links, and more. And Neil is gonna review these different link types, the use cases for each, and best practices for customizing them. This is one of my favorite topics in Flare because using the right link can have such a positive impact on the usability of content. So, Welcome, Neil. I'm so glad to have you with us today. Now, we do have a lot to cover, so just a couple quick housekeeping items before we begin. As a reminder for everyone, it will be recorded, so we will send a link to the recording to everybody that's registered. So if you have to drop out early, not to worry, we'll send it all to you. There is a question panel in GoToWebinar, so feel free to jot down any questions there as they come in, as they pop into your head. We're going to do our best to get to those at the end, and whatever we don't get to, just keep typing them, that's fine. We'll send out a question and answer document to everybody too. So with that, I know, Neil, you've got a lot to cover. Thanks again for joining us today and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, quick sound check, can you guys hear me clearly? One, two, three, four, five, am I coming in clearly? Sounds loud and clear. All right, very good. All right, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, again, I'm Neil. Jennifer did a wonderful job of introducing me, so basically this is who I am. I've been working with Madcap since actually pre-day one. I've been in tech comm since 79, as much as I hate to say it, doing hypertext since 86. So I've had exposure to a lot of things, a lot of different link types, and those pretty much are going to come into play in this presentation. So more specifically, this is what I'm going to talk about. What kind of link types does Flare offer? How do you insert them, which is pretty easy. How do you customize them? <clears throat> which is also pretty easy, uh, but not quite, not always obvious. What are the pros and cons of the different types? And then some general design notes, because um, although some of these things sound quite straightforward, what's a pop-up, what's a hyperlink, there actually are some design considerations that you may want to think about, or frankly, you may have discovered yourselves. So let me start off by diving right into this standard hyperlinks and otherwise known as jump links. So I have a, a little flare project that I put together with little demos and I have a standard hyperlink. I'm in topic A and I have a hyperlink to topic B and if I click on it, boom, I jump to topic B. And the screens are offset so that you could see the starting and ending screen. But in fact, typically, the target screen replaces the starting screen. So the topic B screen would sit on top of topic A, which is fine. So how do you insert these things? Well, it's pretty easy. You type the text or you select the text or the graphic to which you want to apply the hyperlink and you select insert up on the menu, insert hyperlink, or you press control K, or you click the insert hyperlink icon on the toolbar. Flare is famous for giving you at least two ways to do anything. Here is giving you three. Second thing though is what if you want to customize how this link, how this hyperlink appears? And to do this, you would go into the CSS and when I do training, I'll, I often ask the class, what code do you think controls the hyperlink? And the answer is obvious, it's the letter A. Okay, this is usually why your parents edge away from you at Christmas when you start discussing work. But it's the A, because when Tim Berners-Lee came up with hypertext in 1979, came up with HTML in 1979, 1980, he decided that a link was a link 
from one topic to an associated topic. Therefore, a link is associative, ergo the letter A, in case you've wondered. So um, what are the pros and cons of these things? Well, there's a couple of really powerful pros, which is that, first of all, you can link from anything to anything. You can link from a word out to an external URL. You can link a, from a graphic to another topic in your, your Flare project. You can link from a word to an external PDF file, you name it. And it's familiar. Because at this point, almost at any, anybody that we are likely to run into in our work has been on the web. All right, a few, a few years ago, that wasn't necessarily true. And I did occasionally run into people for whom the audience, uh, for, for whose audience your online help was going to be their first foray online. But nowadays, everybody knows pretty much what a hyperlink is. So, it's great. A couple of cons, though, some major cons. The biggest one is that it takes the readers out of their reading path. In other words, let's say that I'm reading a topic, and halfway down the topic, I find a word or a term or something that I'm not familiar with, and sure enough, it's linked. So I click on it, and it takes me to the topic that explains what I, what, explains what I was confused about. And I'm reading that topic, and I find something else that I'm confused about, and sure enough, it's linked, and I've sort of uh, jumped my way down this chain of links, completely away from what I was trying to do in the first place, and eventually, I'm going to have to think, hey, wait a minute, go back and finish what you're doing, and I have to back my way up, not only to get to where I started, but also to get my mind back on track. Saying this is a problem with hyperlinks and also with cross references, but there is a, there are solutions which I'll touch on in a little while. Um, another thing, it's a maintenance problem. We often find this, especially when you're documenting a pre-release software, and there's a feature in that software called. Um, those of you who've heard me speak know that I have a fondness for using um, sub sandwiches as analogies. So there's a topic called sub, and then somebody comes along and says, hey, these things are really called hoagies. So you have to not only change the title of the subtopic to hoagie, but you have to run around the rest of the topics looking for the word sub that links to that topic and change it to hoagie. In other words, it's a large scale search and replace. And it's not difficult to do except sooner or later you will have misspelled the word hoagie and the link will miss it, the search will miss it. Uh, another problem is that we as the authors have to type the link text in the first place and of course edit it if necessary. Another problem for those of you who are doing single sourcing to online and print is that the link style is great for online targets but what happens when you output to PDF? Well, if the user is uh, reading the PDF on the screen, then the links obviously work. But what if they print the PDF? Well, the link obviously doesn't work. So how then do I, the user, figure out, okay, <clears throat> there's a reference to Cocker Spaniels here. And if I were at my computer, I could click that link and jump to that topic but obviously I can't because I'm reading paper. How do I find that topic? And this has been a problem for years until we got to this feature called cross-references or uh, XREFs as they're commonly known. And if you come out of Word or FrameMaker, you're very familiar with cross-references. They've been with us for years. And MANCAP has one type, one generic type of cross-reference. And here's what happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is, again, my little demo topic. And I have a reference that says, here's a cross-reference to topic B. And you notice, by the way, just below it, it says, here's a topic pop-up to topic B. So, okay, that's fine. And let's say I click the cross-reference link, the upper one. 
and it takes me to topic B. So just exactly the same as a hyperlink. Problem though is what happens if on an editing pass I have to change the title of topic B to topic X? Well, look what happens. When I do that, the cross reference is smart enough to actually detect the change in the title and it will change the link for you. So, this is a huge time saver, especially if you're working on a document that's still in flux. There's a lot of changes on things like titles. This is a really useful feature. Um, and in fact, it's got, it's got a lot of pros. It's got a couple of cons. But I will say that I started doing hypertext in 1986. And at the time, all we had were hyperlinks. We did not have cross-references. And when I, Madcap first showed me a cross-reference, my first thought was, well, what does this buy me? And then the engineers explained what it was doing. And from then on, I've been sold. I will use cross-references everywhere except in a couple of very specific situations. And I'll touch on this. So, <clears throat> in other words, if you change the title of a topic that's the target of a cross-reference, when you generate the output, when you generate the target, the, uh, the title, the cross-reference wording, gets updated automatically across the entire project. So this is a huge time saver. One, one problem with this is that maybe you're still working on the project and you're not ready to build yet. So you're, st you're still seeing the old wording in the topic. The title of that topic still says topic B, but you're pretty sure you changed that to topic X. And it's getting a little confusing potentially. So you could wait until you build the project and have the update made automatically, or what you do instead is on the toolbar, you select tools, and then just to the right of center, update cross-references, and that will update all the cross-references in the project before you build. Very nice feature, very useful. All right, how do you insert these things? Easy. Um, you select, again, insert cross-reference, or press Control shift r Those of you who can remember all the accelerator keys like Control shift r my hat's off to you, but it is an accelerator. Or you can click the Insert Across Reference icon on the toolbar. How do you customize these things? Well, if you look on the style sheet, there's a, you'll see a group that's prefaced with madcap vertical type. And those are the madcap specific styles as opposed to the other styles which are worldwide web consortium compliant the madcap styles are specific to flare because they allow us to do things that the worldwide web consortium didn't think of so you select that and you make your change <clears throat> so a couple of pros here Number one is that, as I said, it will automatically change the link text as the target title changes. In fact, you don't even type the link text because Flare will automatically pick up the title of the target topic and use it as the text. So this cuts down a lot of typing. Another nice thing is that, again, for those of you who are generating online and print, what my earlier question, what happens to a hyperlink if the user prints your PDF output? Well, if it's a hyperlink, they're stuck because the link just doesn't work. But in Flare, a cross-reference will automatically change from a link format, you know, click here for information about Cocker Spaniels, to a page reference. See page 22. And it does this automatically. It is a spectacular feature. As I say, it's one of my favorite features in Flare. Okay, this may be quite geeky, but it really has saved me a lot of time in projects. Cons. And this is something to watch out for. It can only be, be used between topics. 
link, first of all. So if I need a link, if I, uh, if I need a connection between topics, I'll use a cross-reference. If I need a connection from a topic out to an external URL or an external PDF file, I have to use a hyperlink there. A cross-reference won't do it. In fact, a cross-reference can only be used by topics to the same target. And I have this in red and italicized because I, um, I find that a lot of people get confused because you're thinking, well, I can use these things between topics in the same project, which is true. But remember that you might be generating different targets that contain different topics. So a cross-reference will only work between topics in the same output target. Okay, important point. All right. Uh, remember I said that the format would change automatically. And how this happens is based on the medium that you're using, the style sheet medium. So if you look over at the left, I've selected the Madcap XREF style, and I have a split screen for my style sheet editor. I'm showing the default medium and the print medium. I find this very useful. If anybody's not sure how I did this, just uh, ask it in the questions and I'll, I'll respond. It's very easy, very useful. But you notice that for the default medium, the format is paratext. And for the print medium, the format is paratext page ref. So this is one of the few places in Flair where you do start speaking in gibberish and sort of code speak. But basically all this is saying is that for the default medium, it's going to use the text of the paragraph that you selected as the link. For the print medium, it's going to use the text of the paragraph that you selected as a link and add the page number on which that paragraph is located. All right, <clears throat> one other little note. Hang on a second. Sorry, throat clearing. One other little note here. You notice that if you look at the screens, look at the panes for my style sheet editor, you notice that I'm showing very few styles, in fact, or very few properties. In fact, I'm only showing two. One of them is font, and the other one is unclassified. Generally, when you're doing work, you see up at the top right, it says show assorted relevant properties. Generally, this says show all properties. And the problem is it's going to show so many properties, you may find yourself getting confused. So what you do is you simply select this option, show assorted relevant properties, which basically means show me only those properties that Madcap thinks I'm most likely to use on a regular basis. And I tend to work like this because I find it simplifies my work. And if there's a property that I need and I can't find it, then I'll think, aha, I have to go to the full list. Okay, but this is how it works. And oh, a second. this is how you set the format. So you notice again, I'm in that up at the top right, show assorted relevant properties style sheet display. And there's my MC format property. And when I click the ellipsis button, I get the cross-reference format dialog box that you see at the left. And this is where I can enter anything I want. And there's a lot of options here. There's probably about 20 or, 20 or more options. I used to know this. Um, and they let you really just create the formula for the page reference by using these available commands. And if you look at these commands, you're going to be tempted to do what everybody does, which is you're thinking, okay, why not just type curly brace B curly brace rather than having to scroll up and down this list and then double click on the command. And you're absolutely right. You can type the commands and I'll warn you that typing the commands sooner or later is going to lead to a typo. So I actually find it less efficient to work off the dialog box than it is to type commands, but it's safer. Just a suggestion. 
All right, so moving on to pop-ups. It's two kinds, topic pop-ups and text pop-ups. So here's a topic pop-up. And when the user clicks on this, what it will do is open a window. It'll pop open a window that sits on top of the current topic. So in other words, rather than taking you from topic A to topic B, it will bring topic B to you and plop it down in a smaller window above topic A, which means the users can see their starting point and their target. I don't have an example of this because this feature pop, uh, topic pop-ups have been with us since the dawn of Flare, and they work like a charm. The only thing is they work if you're generating the HTML5 tripane output, but they don't yet work in the top nav or side nav skins. This is on a feature request list. All right, so if you are trying to use pop-ups, topic pop-ups, and you're using one of the cool new top nav outputs like Coronado, just be aware that your pop-up won't work. All right, hopefully that will be fixed really soon. All right, how do you insert these things? Easy to do. Insert hyperlink or cross-reference, and in the target frame field, there's a pop-up window option. Just select that, go. If you want to customize it, um, if you open the style sheet editor and then expand the A tag, you'll notice there's a sub-tag or a sub-class, to use proper terminology, called pop-up. And that's where you would set the properties. So if you want your pop-up to be blinking red with a uh, green background, you could do it. This is where you would set it. All right, pros and cons. Um, it is excellent for short pieces of content like a phone number. Um, you might have a little reference that says tech support phone number and the user can click and they get a little pop-up window. Or perhaps showing interim steps in a larger procedure. For example, um, you might have a procedure in which step one says log into your account, step two says do something or other, step three says do something or other, and this assumes that you know what you're doing. But it could be that you forgot, how do I log into my account? And maybe under step one, there's a little note, or it looks like a little note that says, remind me, or something like that. Tell me, show me. And if I click on that, it opens a pop-up window, and it shows me the three steps required to log into my account. I do those steps, click the window, it closes, and I just keep going. Um, it can automatically display a glossary terms definition in pop-up form when that term appears in a topic. This is actually quite a mouthful. What this is saying, though, is that for those of you who have glossary tabs in your material, um, because you want an online glossary, that's great. And the glossary tab works fine when you're generating output using the tripane window. Problem is, again, what happens when you go to the cool new templates, like the top nav templates like Gerard and Sunset, where there is no glossary tab per se. Well, you can add one, but it takes some futzing to get it to work the, to work the way you want it to. But the alternative is that you can take, you can create a glossary with all the entries, but tell Flare, don't display this glossary on the glossary tab, but instead find every instance of every term in my glossary in the topics and automatically assign a pop-up definition to them. All right, um, as a blatant sales pitch, I'll say that I'm doing a lightning talk at Mad World on how to do this. All right, it's a, it's a relatively small feature unless you need to do this, and then it's a huge feature, and it's actually very cool. Um, what's nice about pop-ups, again, pop-up, topic pop-ups, is that you might have the tech support phone number that is linked via pop-up in 100 topics. But those topics link to one single topic that contains the phone number, which means if the phone number changes, you don't have to change it 
in every single topic that contains the pop-up link. Just change it in the one topic that contains the phone number and you fixed it everywhere. All right, some cons. Well, Windows controls where a pop-up opens. You don't. So you can't be sure where a pop-up is going to open. Number one, it's a, a sure bet that the pop-up is going to open on top of the starting topic. So it's going to obscure something in the starting topic, which is usually what the user needs. Um, new users may be unsure how to close a pop-up in order to keep reading. I've actually seen cases where users have opened a pop-up topic and couldn't figure out how to close it. So they just left it open and sort of tried to peek around it. So um, the, I do have a feature request into Madcap, as I suppose other, many others do, to just add the little X close button in the upper right corner of the window. But until, until then, what I'll sometimes do if I create pop-ups is I'll put a little graphic say in the bottom left corner of the window, and it just says, please click outside this window to close it. It doesn't do anything. It just tells the users what to do. Uh, plus, potentially another con, a design con, is that if any of you are creating targets that are going to be run on mobile devices, phones or tablets, pop-ups convert to hyperlinks. So it may not be a problem. But if you've designed your material with an eye toward using pop-ups as pop-ups, that's going to be a problem because your design is going to break. So that's just something to be aware of. All right, um, text pop-ups. All right, and again, by the way, I'm hoping this is making sense. If anybody has any questions, um, please don't hesitate to write them down in the chat pod and Jennifer will get to them at the end. And again, if we don't answer all the questions at the end, we save the questions, Madcap will send them to me, I'll answer them and ship them back to you usually within a couple of days. All right, so text pop-ups. And here's a text pop-up. And when I click on it, here's what you get. So it's simple, the code is very simple, it's very efficient. And all you're doing is you're telling Flare, I want to select the words text pop-up and turn, turn them into a text pop-up. I want to assign this text, the text support phone number is, et cetera. I can change the font, I can change the background colors. It's really easy to do. The only problem is that each one of these, as I said, is an individual instance, which means that when the text support phone number changes, you're going to have to go off and, find, and change it in every single instance. And as a project management headache, you're going to have to find every single instance, which means that you may have to generate a report that will do this for you, or keep your own project, keep uh, your own tra tracking spreadsheet, for example, that would specify which topics contain text pop-ups. So again, this is a, uh, an element that complicates project management. Insertion is easy. Select the text and then select insert text pop-up. Uh, you can customize it. And again, in the CSS, you'd select madcap pop-up head for the link, pop-up body for the pop-up itself. All right, and in case anybody is wondering, um, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a line above that says Madcap Pop-Up, and there's a little drop-down button there. So what does that do? Well, if you click that, what it does is it is going to give you access to a whole different world of things because you could now code your pop-ups so that they look different if the user has not clicked on them, they've never been clicked on, the user has clicked on them, the user is hovering over them, the user is hovering over them and has clicked but has not released the mouse button. All right, so <clears throat> we don't see these used that often, but you can do this. So this tremendous customization capability. And again, pros and cons, the code is short, simple, and tiny. So this really doesn't impose any kind of a load 
on the project and on the process. Problem, there's a whole bunch of problems. Um, this opens again on top of the link so that it may cover the content. Again, each pod text pop-up is a separate code instance. And again, if you have these topics that are, are displayed on mobile devices, they convert to hyperlinks. Same problem as I mentioned earlier. All right, so if pop-ups have problems, they pop up, you don't control where they go, they cover up some text, which is usually the text that you're trying to read. One solution, which to my mind is an excellent feature, and that's a dropdown. So here's a dropdown. And it just says, here's a drop down link. Obviously, this would be real text. But when you click on it, here's what you get. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see that there's another paragraph that's dropped down below the link. It says, and here's the body for the drop down link. So if the user clicks the drop down link again, that paragraph rolls up. It's being sort of scrunched into the link and then pulled down out of the link. And it's a neat feature for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that unlike a pop-up, which, as I said, slaps the pop-up window on top of the, your starting topic, this sort of stretches the screen out, stretches the screen down. And then it's like pulling down a window shade. So it stretches the screen down, and then it pulls down the window shade, and there's the body. And the body can contain anything you would put into a topic. Text, graphics, tables, you name it. Um, it is, if, in case somebody's going to ask me, can you have a drop-down link that contains a drop-down link? Yes, you can. Um, the all-time record that I know of was a, a four-level deep drop-down. Drop-down contained a drop-down, which contained a drop-down, which contained a drop-down. And I was really impressed, and I wish the client lots of luck in managing that, because that was just asking for trouble. It worked fine, technically, but trying to manage that project was going to be really difficult. But you can do it. As far, I don't know of any limit as to the number of embedded dropdowns you can have. And how do you do this? Again, type your text, select it. And then you select Use Insert Dropdown. There's another option on the ribbon, Insert Dropdown Hotspot. And that will create the hotspot and then add some pr uh, prompt text. This is the dropdown text. And you can then modify it. So that, that one's up to you. Personally, I just tend to write the text that will be the dropdown hotspot and then write the text just below it. And then just select them both, and then select Insert Dropdown Text. This is just another way to do it. All right, and you can, again, customize these, again, through the CSS. And by the way, when I keep saying you can customize these things, you can't. And at the end, when I talk about some of the design implications of these features, I'm going to suggest why you shouldn't, but you can't. So again, pros and cons. Or the pros, again, it's like a pop-up, but the body displays in that stretch-down area, so you don't have to worry about a drop-down covering other content. Um, I don't know of any cons, but as I say, I'm open to other opinions. I think these are really useful when, for example, if you have to document, say, a dialog box, that might have 10 fields on it. So you want to describe each one of those fields. But if you do, that may look like an awful lot of text below the screenshot of the dialog box. And a user might look at that and get a little antsy, thinking, boy, there's a lot here. Instead, what I always do, and I'm very fond of doing, is I'll type the descriptive content for each field name, but then I'll make each one a drop down so that when the user opens that topic, all they see is the screenshot of the dialog box and a list of the field names, but they won't actually see any content, any other content, any descriptive field content until they click on the link.
So this way it's shorter, it's neater, and it's less intimidating. All right. Um, and by the way, I will note, this is a nice, cool feature. And I'm saying that deliberately, especially for those of you who may be outputting or publishing to Salesforce. And I'll touch on that at the end. All right, expanding links, otherwise known as slide outs. And these are pretty simple. <clears throat> so here's an expanding text link. And when I click on it, and by the way, you see that, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a little icon to the right of the expanding link. It's a little white box with a little blue arrow, right facing blue arrow. The drop down also had one. When it was closed, little white box, right facing blue arrow. When the user clicks the link, the arrow flips so that it's pointing down. These are, uh, these are called twisties. And some people think these are really cool. Some people think these are really irritating and you can get rid of them or replace them again through the style sheet. But anyhow, so I'll click that link and here's the slide out. So what happened is that all that text, where the text slides out to the right, literally it's as if you're pulling a window shade out sideways. All right, so <clears throat> um, actually, I wish I could see some hands because I'm really, but I don't want to take a poll now. I'm just curious how many people use these and like them, but we'll hold that thought a second. Easy to do. Uh, select uh, use, use insert expanding text. And what this will do, this is a little funky because what this will do is create two blocks but in order to see the blocks, you have to select the show tags option. And your hot, your link text will be in one block. The second block will be empty. And what you do is you type or copy the slide out text into that blank box. All right, again, these are easily customizable. Again, code is simple. <clears throat> it is very good for short text only content like a glossary definition or maybe a phone number, something like that. Pros to text only. And there's something about, as I say, reformatting a paragraph on the fly that just seems to annoy people. So if I back up a couple of slides right here, let's say that at the top, the link was an expanding text link in a, in a larger paragraph. When the user clicked on that link and the expanding text, the body slid out, it would reformat the entire paragraph on the fly. And when the user closed it, if they remembered to, it would unreformat the paragraph back to its original state. And when I show these in training classes, my experience is that about 95% of everybody in the class or more likes the drop downs, but very few people like the expanding links. There's something about those that seems to annoy people. And I'm waiting for somebody to chime in and say, we use them and we love them. And that would be fine if they work for you. So finally, <clears throat> the big one, toddlers. And toddlers are a unique feature. When they first came out, I didn't know of any other tool that offered something like this. Let me show you what this does. Um, remember that a drop down link, when the user clicks the link, the body drops down. So the body is always immediately below the link. All right, so here's a toddler. And if I click the link, look what happens couple of things are happening. Number one, here's that sentence. And finally, here's a toddler. But this list of steps, whoops, hang on a second, got ahead of myself. This list of steps, step one, two, three, has appeared below the toddler. So that's the toddler body, the link body. But interestingly, look back up toward the top and a whole new paragraph of text 
plus an image have suddenly popped into view. If I close the toggler, that stuff disappears. Select the toggler, comes back into view. So the analogy that I usually use here, um, I'll be curious to see in the questions if any of you use togglers because my experience is that a lot of people, it's not clear to a lot of people just what these things do. But a slightly different analogy, if you think of a drop-down link as equivalent to that lamp that you have in your living room, and there's a, a switch on the lamp. You turn the switch on, lamp turns on, turn the switch off, lamp turns off. So there's a direct connection between the switch and the lamp. A toddler is more like the light switch at the door into your living room. And when you flip that switch, three separate lamps come on in all different parts of the room. That's a toddler. When you turn a toddler on, the text or the stuff can appear anywhere in the topic. So this is good for things like a common example that I use. You have a procedure. And let's say that the first four steps are identical for everybody, but then maybe the, the remaining steps differ depending on whether you're in the U.S. or Canada. So you could have, after step four, you might have two toddler links, one of which says U.S. and the other one says Canada, and you click the one you want, and you're just seeing only the steps that apply to you. Rather than having to fight your way through a list of steps, where each step is uh, marked US only, Canada only, which works, but it's not as easy to use as something like a toddler. So, and again, you just say use insert toddler. You can customize it through the CSS. Again, the pros, it's like a drop down, but it can show anything or hide anything anywhere and it's up to the reader, which is another nice thing about the toddlers, because you can control what the user sees in the topic through the use of conditional build tags, but the user doesn't control that. The reader doesn't control that, you do. But here, it's up to the reader to say, yes, show me this stuff, or don't show me this stuff, by clicking the toddler. The cons, it takes multiple steps. They're not difficult, but again, they add a few steps. You have to create the content that you want to, I'll apologize, toggleize, and then you give it a name, and then you create the toggler, and then you specify which named content is controlled by the toggler. So it's pretty easy to do, and it is kind of neat. And Saving grace is that it's not the kind of thing that you would do in every single topic, most likely. So it's a little bit more work than a typical link, but you're not doing it everywhere. So that sort of offsets the work, I think. All right, and again, I'll say if any of you are using Togglers, and if you have other use cases besides the one that I just rattled off, different uh, step lists, aimed at different audiences. I'd just be curious to hear about what they are. I've got some other use cases that I discuss, but that's for me probably the most likely one. All right, so having said that, having gone through this, let me discuss, as I promised, some broader design issues or notes. Um, hyperlinks and cross-references are excellent if you want to link the user to related content. And this works everywhere except, in my opinion, if the user, if the link is in the middle of a procedure, of a list of steps in a task. Because in that case, it's too easy for the user to click the link, bounce out of that task to another topic, maybe bounce to another topic, and completely lose the thread of what they were doing. So what I recommend as a design note when people are doing this, is if you have to give users access to related information or inside a task topic, a procedure topic, whatever you call it, use a link that keeps the user in the topic, which means a pop-up, a drop-down, or a toddler, or perhaps 
an expanding link. You can get a sense of how I feel about expanding links and that I didn't even list them here as an option. But they are an option. But just don't let me get out of the topic. Um, again, do you see mobile devices in your future? If you do, remember that pop-ups will convert to hyperlinks. Are you importing old legacy Word or FrameMaker documents into Flare? And if they're old enough, or even today in some cases, I find that people who were using Word or FrameMaker would use underlining for text emphasis. If they do, get rid of it. Because if you import that stuff, users will click on it and then call you up to complain about a broken link. Get rid of the underlining and replace it either with bold facing or italicizing or something, but not underlining. All right, a few more points. If you're single sourcing to online and print targets, as I said earlier, um, don't use hyperlinks. Use cross references for all the links between topics in the target. Again, you'll have to use hyperlinks to link out of the top, out of the target, to link to an external URL or an external PDF, for example. But other than that, use cross references. Um, think twice. This is what I said I was going to suggest. Don't customize your link styles. It's tempting, and I've seen people do some really cool stuff. And I'll tell you why. There's, um, in the industry, there's actually a good trend here. Does, has anybody ever heard of uh, a product called OWL, O-W-L, Guide? And I'm going to bet that the answer is no, because this tool is so old. This tool came out in 1988. And it was produced by uh, in the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And OWL stood for Office Without Limits. It was the first GUI hypertext authoring system. So I'm going to date myself badly and say that I was one of the first users of this tool. And it had this really cool feature, which was that it offered something like 10 different types of links, something I don't remember exactly what the details are. But let's say there was 10 different types of links, and each type of link had its own icon. So, and again, I'm just, I would have to find, find it and look this up. But a hyperlink, for example, the icon might have been a rabbit bouncing with little jump lines. And um, a pop up, or a pop up might have been a rabbit, and a hyperlink was a, a rifle crosshair or something like that. And the idea was that by looking at the link, at the icon, that would tell you what kind of link you were going to be following. And it turned out nobody cared because nobody could remember. And if anybody remembers WinHelp, Windows Help from Microsoft in 1991, WinHelp came out with two link formats. One of them was they were green. And if it was a hyperlink, if it was a jump, it had a single underline. If it was a pop-up, it was green and it had a dotted underline, and that was that. So they went from 10 different icons or representations to two. And then when Microsoft came out with the HTML help system, which is really the basis for everything that we do nowadays, it had one link style, which was blue text solid underline, period because it turned out that people just didn't care. So if you customize your links away from the de facto standards, you're going to have to be prepared to explain to your users that that little icon with the pink bunny jumping over a cloud is actually a hyperlink. It's probably not worth it. And again, I'm fully prepared to have somebody tell me they're wrong. I'm wrong. And it works for them, and that's fine, because we're talking about design here. Uh, where do you place the links in a topic? It depends. There's three schools of thought. One, which the Microsoft Manual of Style supported for a long time, was put them at the bottom, like a see also list. Or you could put them at the top. 
I always argue that they want to be in context, in the body of the topic, where the users might see them in the first place. So that if I see a word, uh, or let's say it's some term and I don't understand what it is, I know that I can click a link right there. And the fact that the link is there tells me that there's a link. I follow that link. And then when I back up, it takes me back to my starting point. If the links are at the bottom, I have to scroll down to the bottom to see if the link is even there. And if it's not there, I'm going to have to scroll back up to where I was reading, feeling very annoyed. If the link is there, I'll follow it, jump to my next topic, back up, and I still have to find my way back to where I was reading. So I always argue that the links should go in context in the body. All right, and I'll end by saying this. You've got a lot, a lot of link options here beyond the standard familiar hyperlinks and topic pop-ups. And they have design implications and they have different use cases that make them very flexible and very powerful. And I think if you haven't explored all these links, it's worth trying. It's worth creating a little test project. So basically this is who I am. And with that, Pass Thank you. Yeah, Neil, thanks so much. That was terrific. Um, we have some good questions that have come in, but and before we turn our attention to those, just reminding everybody, Mad World is around the corner. San Diego, April 14th through the 17th. If you haven't yet registered, you have until the 15th of this month to save up to $400. Our discounted room block at the Hard Rock is also down to the last couple of rooms. So if you're holding off and you want to come, don't wait too much longer because you can still save quite a bit of money through the 15th. So if you haven't registered, we hope to see you. And then shortly after that, in the fall, we're going to be heading to Dublin uh, for Mad World Europe. So if we have any folks across the pond on the call today, we hope to see you there uh, October 8th through 11th. And the first early bird registration discount is coming up on the 31st where you can save up to 900 on that registration. So it's a good savings. So we hope to see you there. Um, I'm, I'd like to turn our attention to the questions. There are a couple, um, I wanna start with one that was asked by a few people, a few different ways, but kind of shares the same theme and it's a fantastic question. Um, okay. Neil, can you talk a little bit about um, what happens to the dynamic content, so the drop down links, the expanding text, mm -hmm. when we're going to online, what's, what do we need to be mindful of if we're going for taking that sort of uh, online specific effect and we also are single sourcing to print? You know, what, what happens and, and what to think about there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, to those of you who asked that question, and to Jennifer, thank you. Because um, I said there was one other issue that I was going to talk about which actually just popped up last week, and I didn't get it into the slides. But the question is broadly, what happens to all these dynamic features when you go out to different formats? Uh, especially when you go out to print, or if you go out to Salesforce. Because um, first of all, for print, the all these cool features work, the drop downs, the slide, the expanding links, the toggles, they all work. In, all, in the, all the HTML5 outputs, aside from the occasional thing that got overlooked, like the topic pop-ups not yet working in the top nav and side nav skins. But when you go to print, what happens, first of all, what happens to these things? Because for example, what happens if you have a pop-up link? And well, it works, but what happens when it goes to print? And Flare actually offers three options for fixing this. They're in the target editor, uh, I believe they're in the advanced tab. And you can tell Flare, convert this to a numbered footnote. So your pop-up link, for example, literally gets converted to a numbered footnote. Or you could say, expand the text, expand the link in line. So you would see the link itself followed by the link body expanded in the text behind it or you know, at, right after it. And the third option is just ignore the, the body text, ignore the link body. Between those three, I think that ignoring the link body is just a bad idea because there's information there that you wanted. Expanding it in line 
works, but it could look kind of clunky. So the best the best option in my mind is you convert it to a numbered footnote. And it works fine. The only problem is that occasionally you might have a footnote that is so big because there was so much information in the pop-up that that topic, that page only shows three lines of the body text and the rest of it is a footnote which could look a little weird. All right. So just to make sure, is this going in the right direction that you guys were thinking of? Yeah, no, I, I think that's helpful. So I, I hope that helped for the folks that, that asked that question. Every, I know there was sort of like, okay, well, great. What happens when we go to print? You know, are we going to lose this stuff? So it sounds like there are some options there. There are, and I'll just throw out one more thing for any of you who are going to be using Flare and the Salesforce Connect plugin to publish out to Salesforce Knowledge. Just be a, several things to be aware of, but on the link side, be aware that Salesforce won't pick up the JavaScript that drives these special purpose links or any of the other MADCAP specific code. So what you have to do is if you're generating output that's going to be published to Salesforce, you make sure that you generate it using the clean XHTML target format in Flare and that you don't use any of these cool special features. All right. And if it's a case where you really do want to use these cool special features, you can do that by creating the topic, adding the special features, but controlling whether or not they are pushed into the output by using conditions. So there's a lot of twists and turns here. And then one point of clarification, you, and sort of back to the beginning, you mentioned pop-ups don't work in mobile. So the question was, can you clarify, do you mean tablet and phone? Yeah, um, do I mean tablet and phone? Um, I won't say uh, exclusively that they just don't work in all mobile outputs but uh, or all devices, but my experience is that they don't work in under Android, they convert to hyperlinks, and they don't work under iOS, they convert to hyperlinks on both tablets and phones. It, it, might, it could be that this may be fixed in the near future, and it could be that some of the lesser known plat mobile platforms might support it, but on iOS and Android, as far as I know, as up to date as I am, they don't work, they convert to hyperlinks. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe time for maybe one or two more here, but um, one great question. Can you use variables and pop-ups? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry if that sounded like a wicked laugh. Um, yes, you can. Um, in fact, you can use variables anywhere, well, almost anywhere in Flare, and they work beautifully. The only problem is that it becomes a problem of project management. Because if you're using variables, you're going to have so many permutations in this project that if you do not document your projects, if you don't write up a project description, I can almost guarantee that at some point the project is going to go out of control. So the short answer is mechanically, yes. Managerially, I think about it. Yeah. Stay organized. Um, this, this is a great question too. Can you reuse a toggler from topic to topic? Yeah, can you reuse a toggler from topic to topic? Yeah, you can copy it. Um, the only problem is that, remember, a toggler is operating, a toggler is made up of two things. It's made up of the toggler itself and the named content that the toggler controls. So you can certainly create a, a toggler in topic A and then copy the toggler code and paste it into topic B. But if topic B doesn't have the same named content, the toggler won't do anything. Got it, okay. Um, yeah, so another one came in, uh, variables and text pop-ups. So sounds like that would be supported as well or only in the topic pop-ups? You know, that's, that's an excellent question. I am pretty sure they're supported, but I'm, uh, actually no one's ever asked me that before, so thank you. Um, but when the question comes to me, I'll try it and let you know. Okay. In, in the question and answer document, I'll give it a try and I will let you know what happens. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so one last question, I think, before we wrap, just to be, you know, uh, respectful of everybody's time. Cross-references as page numbers sounds great. Mine just show as text in PDF output. How can I make these change to page numbers? Um, that may require a little bit more than one minute, but... <laughs> actually, no, it's, it's going to require less than one minute because um, short answer is I don't know. I would have to look at the code because there's something in your code that's not registering it. Yeah. So if you would like, um, if you want to zip up your zip up your project using the flare zip feature on the project tab and send it to me with a little description of what's happening, I will I'll take a look. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, and for, for the person, just a reminder everybody, Neil's uh, email is up on screen, so jot it down and... Um, if you need that. Well, we are over time here. So we've got some great questions that have been uh, coming in. We'll keep this open for just another minute. If you can think of anything else, jot it down. We're going to compile everything that we didn't get to and the things we did get to. And we're going to send it out to everybody so that everybody has a reference for all these great questions that you've had. So I want to thank everybody for joining. Neil, thanks for taking the time with us today. Um, I, I hope everybody time. enjoyed it. Yeah, and I think it was a, a great exercise and, and, and I learned something as well. So I wish everybody a wonderful rest of the week. Thanks again for joining. And we hope to see you uh, at MadWorld and also on the next webinar. So we'll speak to you all soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay.